Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and I welcome you to another edition of Books and Looks. That's right, my weekly podcast where we review books, where we discuss things with the author, and then I talk about something that I've been looking at in the past week. And it's been a really good week for us here in Books and Looks. You know, we're back here again. The fall schedule is now really getting into the swing of things. Thanks to all of you for following us, for coming back. A lot of good response for the Julia Bryan Thomas interview, so we're real excited about that. But today, we have got a really good book and interview. The book we're doing today is called Food and Crime, the author, Chris Garcia. Now, Chris is going to take us through something that I guess we all know about, but nobody ever really writes about, and that's the crimes involving food. I tell you, not all true crimes are blood, guts, and gore, but this is stuff involving food. So today he's going to talk to us about crimes that are going to be involving such things as maple syrup, cheese, artichokes. Yeah, artichokes. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be telling us all about it. We have a lot of fun. We chuckle a lot during this interview. I'm going to tell you what. But he's a fun guy. It's a very fascinating interview. And I'm going to tell you what. I think you're going to learn a lot about food and crime. So listen, I have a review on it up on my website, viewsonbooks.com. You want to go take a look at that. But hey, first, give a listen to Chris Garcia as we discuss food and crime. Chris, welcome aboard. Ah, it's great to be here. Well, Chris has written a wonderful book called Food and Crime, and it's a wonderful book. I've learned so doggone much about it, and I am so pleased that we have Chris here today. And Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you go to school? Did you take any courses in journalism or investigative journalism? How did you get into the whole writing? Well, it's weird. I actually went to a little place called Emerson College, and I was a creative writing major, and... I, after I graduated, said, I'm never going to write again. <laughs> and I tried a little bit, and then I stopped. And then around 2005, I decided I was going to become a writer because I had fallen into science fiction fandom. And I was going to become a writer. I was going to send out short stories. And I sent out hundreds of short stories. Never publish a single one. <laughs> so I flipped and I went over and started doing zines, my own zines. That worked really incredibly well. It allowed me to go into like, I did what are called perzines or personal fanzines. And I would write about everything under the sun. I'd write about movies. I'd write reviews. I'd write a little bit of short story stuff, but mostly it was all nonfiction. And that turned out to be so well, one, because no one could say, no, I'm not going to publish you. So, you know, my really bad stuff got out there. <laughs> but it got me into the habit of writing and focusing on the nonfiction aspect. And then... I decided to get back into actually trying to publish. And from 2010 to 2021, I sent out hundreds of novel proposals, book proposals, everywhere I could. Tried to get an agent. Couldn't get a single thing like that. One day I get a call and it's pen and sword, basically cold calling me with a book deal. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> now, for people who don't know, pen and sword is over in England, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they are. They're an English company. And what they were doing, and I think this is so smart of them, is because groups like My Favorite Murder and Last Podcast on the Left had had so much success well, for their books, they were looking for podcasters. And somehow they had found one of my several podcasts called Dial a Crime, which is all about nonviolent true crime stories. And they found it and they offered me a book deal. It was so strange. Because I had been trying desperately for years and years to publish stuff. And the opportunity just fell into my lap. So I consider myself lucky on that face. I remember when I was talking to your PR people over at Penn and Sword, I said, well, you know, it's no trouble. It'll be mid-afternoon when they record, and that's in the morning here. And they go, no, no, he's, he's in California. I said, really? I had no idea. And they're a very nice group of publishing people. I like them a lot. They have good authors and good stuff that's coming out from them. So, And yours is really one of those books. And tell me, what was the impetus for food and crime to make a book about this? Well, as a gentleman of girth, <laughs> I have always had food love that is overwhelming for me. And, you know, I actually have a very unique sociopolitical racial background. My father was half Hispanic and half Ohlone Native American around these areas. And then, you know, I have the European mother. And I grew up in an area that was very much influenced by 
Asian cooking, Mexican cooking. You had pupusas here, which I just love. And so that got me into food. And I very much, during the food TV explosion of the late 90s, early 2000s, started discovering food writing, and I loved it. Parallel, I turned 13 in 1988. And one of the things that was happening in 1988 were anniversaries. It was 100 years of Jack the Ripper. It was 25 years of JFK. It was 20 years of the Zodiac. And there were specials on everywhere. And that got me interested in crime. And I don't remember the first time I thought about foods and crime, but I do know I was looking up everything. There's a great book called Swindled that I think came out in 2013 that I picked up. That was fascinating to me. And so that was sort of an area that I instantly gravitated towards. And, you know, the past five or six years, I've been very, very interested in the intersections of food and crime. And one of the other interesting things is the areas of how we view food and how we view crime. And it's great to see now we're starting to see this probably about a dozen books that sort of look at the overlap. There's a lot of documentaries and podcasts that have gone into that realm. And so I very early saw a crowded marketplace and said, me too. Well, I tell you, it certainly works. But now, how long did it take you to research this? Because you've got some really in-depth research from way back when and, <laughs> and some of the crimes. How long and where did you find everything? So my day job is I'm an archivist. And I've been a curator at a museum, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, for 20 years I was there. So I got really good at very quickly finding what the interesting stories are in a realm and then how to very quickly get into them. So the whole writing process took me about six months. The research process probably took me a month and a half, two months of just solid research. And then the, you know, start and stop writing process. It's very difficult. The hardest part was actually finding photos. That took me a good month and a half to do because Getting information now is so easy. We have the internet, which is a positive and a negative. Anyone can say anything on the internet. But the other thing is what the most important thing you'll find anywhere is there are citations, particularly on Wikipedia. And once you start diving into citations, what you find is there are, for everyone, there are like five or six things that are linked to it that aren't mentioned in those main texts. And so I got through that very, very quickly. And I probably spent... The energy was probably 90% writing, 10% research. Probably the enjoyment was 90% research and 10% writing. Right. Well, now, were you doing this during the COVID period? No, it was immediately after. It was, I think, late 2021. I had just started a new job in the middle of 2021, so most of my job is scanning. And we have slow machines, so that gives you a long period. You know, a scan might take 20 minutes. There's 20 minutes I can go out there and research on, you know, how much cheese is stolen in the world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I tell you, it's fascinating. These stories you have collected are absolutely fascinating. And one of the things we start out with is you mentioned that food crimes are now some of the oldest known crimes and some of the earliest laws relate to this. How far back are we talking, Chris? Well, I believe that the oldest surviving legal code, which is the Code of Uranamu, includes three property crimes, at least the surviving version that we have, and all of them are with agricultural land use. <laughs> so now, how long ago was that, Uranamu? How long was, did we look at that? 5,500 years, I think. Oh, my Lord. Really? Oh, my word. Yeah. The Code of Hammurabi has food crimes listed in it. You know, it's all of this stuff from uh, Mesopotamia, and Ur, and all of these sort of early civilizations. And by the time we get to, so it must be more than five, it must be closer to six. Once we get to ancient Egypt, there's an entire structure of food and crime that's already been built upon these sort of existing rules because food is an essential life need. And the line I always say about the book is anyone who is alive and wants to stay that way needs to deal with food. And crime is something that is once you have something that that essential, you have crime happening in those arenas. And I think that's really, 
made my job easy because it's all there. Wow. Well, that's fascinating. Now, you in your book, and again, you divide this up very well. You divide it up into four major areas of food crimes and then tell stories in each of those areas. But what are those four areas that we're talking about? What are the areas of food crime? Well, there's theft, which is the most obvious. I mean, literally picking up and walking away with stuff. Okay. Which is fascinating. It's the largest arena for sure. It's the most varied. You have fraud, which is the most fun to write about. <laughs> you have organized crime and coercion, which always depends on one of the other three areas to make it happen. But it is the organization and the moving towards a specific goal or direction that makes that very different than every other things. And the last one is the the saddest and honestly the hardest to write about, assault and murder which is the one that tends to get the most headlines. If it bleeds, it leads long time saying, but it's also the one that has a lot of crossover with a whole bunch of other things that made that section, that four stories I wrote in that section fascinating because you can look at things like family dynamics. You can look at things like the immigrant experience, all of which play into individual stories within the food crime vein. And as we record this, it's near the end of August 2023. And just this past week, we had the young 16-year-old girl killed over some McDonald's sauce packets. Did you read about that? I heard something about that on Facebook. We see crimes like that a lot. You'll see things like one of my friends sent me a thing saying, Chris, you should do this in your sequel. And I'm like, well, if I write a sequel, maybe I will. But it was a story of a man who went into a Wendy's and stole the cash register, but then stopped to eat French fries. <laughs> and <laughs> that's what caught him. He, he stopped to eat French fries. <laughs> and I kind of understand the, the need. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, it's, it certainly is fascinating. Now, when we talk about the food theft, now we've got a few things to talk about in this. You have a little acronym. You put down the word craved c-r-a-v-e-d what does that stand for well the craved model is concealable removable available valuable enjoyable and disposable and you can't really steal something that can't walk away and you can't steal something that ain't there but the real key is the last three the v-e-d is the valuable because people's effort psychologically needs to get you to something that has value enjoyable is the other one is you aren't going to take these risks without having some sort of potential joy out of it and disposable is of course just it has to be something you can move so one of my things is love very few people steal whole mahi mahi fish very few people do but a lot of people steal shrimp because shrimp is valuable it's small it's concealable it has all of these sort of little tiny things that you can take and get away with it. And this craved model, which I think was developed initially by the American Retailers Association, American Food Retailers Association, I think it was, definitely it explains all the things that you can do that will make something needable by the average consumer, but also desired by <laughs> thieves. Yep. Wow. Well, one of the first stories you get into has to do with cheese, which is, I think you said, the most stolen food, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is the most stolen food in supermarkets in particular. In general, it's right up there because it's mobile. It's in packages and stores that are usually small, easily to conceal to the classic wheels that are aging in Italian warehouses. They're in the shape of wheels. You can just roll them right out. <laughs> I brought a wheel of cheese back one time from Italy. Those were the days when you could when you could bring that onto the plane. <laughs> I don't think you can anymore. <laughs> so I go up to Sonoma, and we have wonderful cheese factories here. And they have a place that does uh, Parmigiano-Reggiano-type cheese, legally. And it literally, if you order it, they will roll it to your car. <laughs> it's, it's fun to watch. Yeah. Well, now, how much is stolen? And what does that compute to in terms of poundage or what's it come up to? Do you have an idea? 
the last figures I found were about 20 million tons of cheese is produced annually, which means about 100 million tons of cheese ends up stolen. 100 million tons of cheese. Yeah. And that number is huge. But the amazing thing is that all this stolen cheese ends up somewhere. And it's incredible to think of how much of that cheese we probably eat on an every day, you know. Stolen cheese tends to be less bought by sort of the big chains, but they end up a lot of times in mom and pop pizza shops, for example. It doesn't end up in supermarkets as much as it does, and this is the weird one, as in sort of specialty shops. And if you live sort of off of the fast food world, you're likely eating some stolen cheese every day. <laughs> wow. Wow. Isn't that something? Oh, oh, my God. That's a lot of money that's being lost then. Oh, absolutely. It's a major leading loss. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things you talk, and I, I, we're going to let you go into this thing, because I thought this was absolutely hilarious. You witnessed a cheese fight, I think, if I'm not mistaken, which ended up in a theft. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I walked into a Safeway that I didn't usually go to that is in one of the tonier parts of the Bay Area, a place called Saratoga. And it's a lovely little town. <laughs> and I was there, and... As I got in and I was getting my, I think I was getting a prepared chicken, and I could hear there was a fight going on, and I thought it was just a man and his girlfriend arguing. And at some point, one of them starts to throw, because they're standing right by the cheese cooler, which is right sort of by where the door goes. There's a straight line, and <laughs> starts throwing cheese. So what is the other person? At the other person, and literally it slides out the open door because the uh, automatic doors were open at that point, and they were throwing it at it, and it was sliding out, out to the front of the store. Well, that was strange, and man goes, and everyone leaves, and as I'm leaving, I see there's a car, and the guy and the girl and someone else together leaving. So obviously they were throwing it outside. So it could be gathered. Oh, my word. So there was another person involved. The getaway guy, was was he grabbing up the cheese that went outside? That must have been. That's the only way I could think of it, because they would have kept an eye on the two while they were <laughs> being escorted out. Oh, my. We I was reading this to the family. No one could figure out how, the, how, how they were. Were they throwing one and putting one in their pocket? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we couldn't figure out how this happened, but throwing it out the door. <laughs> As I sort of processed uh -huh. it later, it's like, what they've done is they've created a moment of tension that everyone wants to make go away. So they are less likely to look into the specifics of what's happening. And if you have that third person who can go and gather everything up, they're going to be dealing with where the tension is coming from, not necessarily with all the things attached to it. And it's just a brilliant ploy. <laughs> one wonders how many grocery stores they did that at and have they been copied? I hope that me writing about it hasn't made people <laughs> do it more. Another one of the things, again, again, friends, you don't realize some of the things that are stolen. And this is one, the next one, this was amazing to me. Maple syrup. Maple syrup is a huge theft item. Can tell us a little bit about what goes on with maple syrup? Yeah, well, maple syrup has sort of two realms where theft happens. And there's one where people who just go out and tap trees that they don't own to make their own maple syrup. And it's fairly easy to make. It's a little tetchy to make things come out the way you want them, but any syrup is good syrup. But there were groups, because maple syrup is so regulated in Quebec, that saw it being very advantageous to figure out ways to siphon off syrup from warehouses. And... <laughs> One of the reasons for that is, since there is a group that is so protective of syrup, the prices are kept very stable. So if you dump a whole bunch of more unapproved syrup into the chain, you're making a lot more money. And what their theory could be is, well, since it's being at this stable price point, you can just keep pumping it out. And the way that FPAQ, F-P-A-Q, is the group, the one thing they could do to sort of make it pointless is they could drop the price, but then that would hurt all of the people who are selling, you know, maple syrup. But there was an organized group of folks who 
stole just so much maple syrup. A guy by the name of Ricard Velers. It was a barrel roller and this sort of a dealer in maple syrup. And this is what's great about some older areas of crime because maple syrup crime goes a long way. <laughs> it goes back into the at least the 19th century. They have these sort of lexicons. So, you know, you have a barrel roller, someone who produces their own stuff and then moves it directly from the producers to the retail. And, you know, this colorful thing. These are colorful, strange characters who are always sort of, you know, there was a guy who was very much a organized crime figure in Quebec and Montreal, but a very colorful character. And what's great is one of the ways I found out about this was there was a documentary done about it in probably 15 years ago. There's also a podcast that covers it. And it's a, just a fascinating, this idea. We don't think of maple syrup as being sort of a valuable commodity because we think of, you know, of the bottle that we have in our, our house. But then you sort of think about it. Well, on the high end, it's one of those things that, you know, you don't expect it to sell for dozens of dollars, <laughs> but it really does. And again, it's one of those things. People love it. I can't imagine breakfast sausages without maple syrup. Um, it's portable. So, you know, they put it in barrels like oil. That's the amazing thing that sort of got to me was they transport this like they would oil in many countries. So it's like 55 gallon uh, or 80 gallon barrels. Yeah. And one of the reasons why they call them barrel rollers is because they're round barrels. You can just get them out. But, you know, once you get a group who has access to a forklift and some trucks, you can move a whole bunch of it all at once. And their method was great. What they would do is they would siphon off the syrup from a barrel, refill it with water and put it right back where it was. And in the warehouse phase is when things are most accessible and where they're least sort of checked up on. And so when things are kept in a warehouse, then the FPAQ has massive warehouses of maple syrup. They have three or four of them. Once it's in that state, they're only looking for the obvious problems. So they're not looking for what barrel is full of water. They're looking for what barrel is missing. And eventually they realized they weren't even paying that much attention to which barrels were missing and would just take the barrels and not put any back. Wow. How long was this able to go on? I think that one was probably four years total. But odds are, to this day, there are probably people who are doing similar scams on a smaller level. And this is one of the areas where, you know, you see organized crime coming in is areas where there are large scale availability of item and a warehouse is great because it's a supermarket for criminals basically yeah but they went on for years so we're talking maybe thousands of gallons of syrup being taken away and put in the black market oh yeah absolutely and i want to say it was he says remembering the book um probably somewhere in the tens of thousands of oh, gallons <laughs> And they didn't, they didn't check the, their own on their warehouses. That's the other thing. What were they doing? Well, my guess is this, is when you are trying to maintain the price of a commodity like maple syrup, you want to keep it as slowly rolling as possible. It's actually to their benefit to not necessarily check so they can give an honest accounting. They want to make it seem like there is a scarcity. And so not having your random patrols. Now, it's also the classic thing is if you pull from the back instead of the front, you're less likely to be noticed. But at the same time, it seems like they were just taking whole racks. And it's also, you might not know if you were on the night shift that the day shift had pulled a couple of hundred barrels. And so you know, all these little things sort of come together. And once you realize that you can do a thing, you realize you can do a thing again and again and again and again and again. Wow. And they finally were able to catch this group, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. They threw the book at them fairly hard. <laughs> All right. Well, but I think there was a gentleman in another province that got it, and he kept saying, well, don't don't look at me. I uh, I don't know where this came from. It's I just got maple syrup, and now you can't arrest me. But I think they did get him, too, the distributor. Yeah. His argument was very interesting. He said, once I have it, it's no longer Quebec uh, maple syrup. And 
Well, that's maybe not true. What's fascinating, though, and I couldn't cover it in the book, but I found this out just recently, was they can now do analysis on the syrup and give you pretty much to the neck of the woods that that syrup came from. Wow. I never knew that. <laughs> oh, my. That's interesting. Yeah, and that's going to make the next phase of maple syrup theft. And this ain't going to stop. Um, it's going to make it way more interesting and more actionable by the police. But there'll be somebody going to try to get their maple syrup. I'll tell you. That's one of the things. Now, we move up to another area about fraud. Now, fraud was interesting because I think you talked about some of the earliest known cases of insurance fraud. And this goes back to around 2300 AD or something like that. What, tell us a little bit about that. Well, there was a thing called bottomry, which is basically a form of shipping insurance. So you want to make sure that your stuff gets to the other side. And if it doesn't, you want to make sure that you are made whole financially from not being able to sell your goods. And so a guy named Hegestratus figured out that, you know what? If I load my ship with corn, that I get somehow dirt cheap. And then I don't put all of it on there, but I put some of it on there and sink it. They're going to pay me out for the whole shipment, not just the little bit that fell. So in, you know, 300 BCE, Hegestratus came up with an idea how to defraud his insurers. <laughs> and, you know, this is the first known insurance fraud that we could think of. And what's fascinating is that when he went to scuttle the boat, he ended up drowning. No. <laughs> that backfired. <laughs> yeah. And part of it was because his crew tried to stop him. And there are lots of different ways that this could be playing out. One, most of the crews were paid out because of the goods that they were selling, they would usually get a cut of the sales. But what I also think is the ships were usually where they lived. So he was literally sinking their houses. And so all these things sort of made it like something that, you know, the crew definitely wants to stop. Or it could just be a union action of some sort. We're not sure about those. Wow. So that's uh, one of the things of Freud. And again, we're not giving away the whole book here, folks. We're talking little bits of this. So there's lots in this book about under each section. And that's what makes this so fascinating. Now, one of the things, it's not a fraud story per se, but we had a couple big names in the restaurant and hotel industry who were also sort of involved in food theft. Could you tell us a little bit about them? Oh, yeah. There are two sort of, I think of them as the founding characters of the modern hospitality world. And they are Escoffier, who is the French god of cooking. There are a couple of people who sort of defined what modern French cooking is. And Escoffier is one of those people, like, he's on the Mount Rushmore. I'm sorry, Mont Rushmore. But the other one is a guy named Cesar Ritz. And Ritz was a hotelier and was an amazingly far-seeing character who really understood how to build luxury into hostelry, how to bring people in, and always knew that how to make a customer feel like they were being pampered. And we still have the word ritzy in our, our thing, and that's because Cesar Ritz understood how to build this idea of luxury into travel, because travel for a long time wasn't the most comfortable of things. <laughs> No, it wasn't. And they're both involved. We're going to not get into the whole thing about the two of them because they are also involved in some of these areas. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, which is really not in the fraud area, but there was this sort of really amazing menu that Caesar Riz prepared. Was it for New Year's or something like that? And because they were running out of food? Yeah. So the Siege of Paris. Ah, the Siege of Paris. Okay. Yep. Had made it impossible to get food into Paris. But. They still had people there who they needed to take care of for Christmas. So working with his chef, a chef by the name of Charon, who wasn't Escoffier yet, they hadn't yet crossed paths, they came up with this menu using anything they could get their hands on, including zoo animals. So the entrees were pigeon and roast camel a la anglaise, civet of kangaroo, you had bear ribs, Haunch of Wolf, which 
would have been probably disgusting because yeah yeah but cat with rats which i always thought was actual cats and rats but it's actually a dish that they made now it's usually made with either chicken or a uh, squab but in this case it possibly would have been cats and rats oh (laughs) my word oh my word they were making do with what they could get and you know the siege of paris would have been a terrible time to be in paris and there's still cesar ritz's whole idea was we have to provide luxury to the people we have the best that we can and if that means eating consomme of elephant trunk that's what we're going to do wow and the zoos willingly sold this to ritz Apparently so. I've never dug into that aspect as much as I probably should have. But I think one of the things that has happened in many places during times of siege is often they're just abandoned. Yeah. And that's sad on one level, but on the other level, it does make it easy picking. So. Wow. Uh, the, well, so, so there's some of the big names in food are involved in some of this also. That's uh, quite something. What I want to go to next, and this one cracks me up, and this is artichokes. (laughs) Okay, I don't eat a lot of artichokes, but there apparently was a big food crime with artichokes. Tell us a bit about what that's all about. Well, artichokes have always been a big thing in the Italian community, both in Italy and the immigrant community here in the U.S. And organized crime has had a very large Italian presence in the U.S. organized crime world since the 1800s. But what's amazing is that a guy named Chiro Terranova decided what he was going to do was he was going to control the artichoke market. And what's fascinating in the U.S., they grow a few places, but there's sort of a streak right here in Northern California on this. Actually, it's North Central California coast. You get fog, lots and lots of rain. And it's from this Half Moon Bay down to a place called Castroville. And Castroville is currently the world's artichoke capital. More artichokes are grown in Castroville than anywhere else in the world. Wow. But at that time, they sort of had this sort of strip from Castroville up to Half Moon Bay, about 50 miles or so. And he would intimidate the farmers to give him the price that he wanted. He would intimidate the sellers in New York. And so he's operating one group in just outside of the Bay Area to control the prices that he can get and control in the New York markets. And this was widely known. That's the thing is organized crime in New York at this time was very, very open about existing. The specifics weren't as widely known, but people knew there was organized crime. And one of the people who knew and had sworn to clean up the streets was Fiorella LaGuardia, one of the most colorful figures in American history. And he decided that he was going to clean up the streets. And one of the things he was going to do was stop the artichoke trade. As the mayor, he's going to do this. Yep. And the mayor decided he was going to stop all artichoke sales. And he did. Terra Nova lost a ton of money. But more importantly, he lost sort of that image that he could run the whole thing. The mayor basically reestablished the mayor's office and the city as the driving force in the market of New York instead of the organized crime figures. And he used the most obvious and dangerous one of those, which was the artichoke market, because it was such a big part of the Italian community. And so he basically banned everything, if I'm not mistaken, correct? He banned the sale of artichokes for, it ended up being for a couple of weeks. And then what happened is when he reopened it, he said, all you vendors, increase your prices. You can make a little extra money because people are going to want these artichokes now that they can get them again. And made deals with restaurants and stuff to feature artichokes on the menu. And the American artichoke market was very much moved forward outside of just the Italian community into the wider world because of this idea that we got to get artichokes back in people's hands. But it really changed the agriculture world out here because they no longer had to worry about because literally... He was having people bombing, flying planes over and dropping bombs on fields. Oh, my word. Wow. And these things have huge, wide-ranging impacts. And here, it's California and New York are deeply tied. And it really speaks to you know how our food networks have grown, how individual communities that, when they establish themselves, maintain contact. 
you sort of see that in a couple of different stories here throughout the book is the idea that we are connected to more than just our local surroundings when it comes to food. Right. Right. Wow. Well, that's fascinating. And I, there's still more I would want to go over with you, but we're starting to run out of time here. So I wanted to ask you this. What's next for Chris Garcia? Do you have another book deal with the pen and sword? Are you doing other types of books? What are you doing right now? I don't know. I might want to do a sequel to this. I might also want to do food and fashion. I haven't really started writing anything. I'm still doing my zines. I'm still writing about film. And right now I'm just dealing with things. I'm uh, up for an award called the Hugo again, which is always nice for the zine. So once that happens, I'll be happy to know. But it's always something's coming up. And I probably will end up doing another book, but it probably won't be for another five or six years. Oh, okay. So you're not actively sitting there and researching anything right now or getting anything down on paper for a book. Well, I'm researching everything. (laughs) But not specifically for a book. Oh, no, it's just to satisfy my own attention deficit ordered brain. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. I can sit in front of a computer and search things all the time, you know, and (laughs) it's not going anywhere in my brain, but I I, I know a lot of junk, apparently. So, uh, wow. Well, that's really something else. I really appreciate it. Chris, this has been a lot of fun. Friends, this is a great book, Food and Crime by Chris Garcia. We didn't get a chance to go into everything. There are more questions. There are more crimes. Again, we touched a little bit on these different segments, and I think you're going to really, really enjoy this because you learn a whole heck of a lot about what goes on in this food industry and things we don't even think about. That's why the prices go up higher, folks. Cover the cost of the theft. So anyway, Chris, thanks so much for coming with us today. Great. It was so glad to be here. Always glad to talk food. (laughs) All the time. Good. If I'm not eating, I'm talking about it. I don't blame you. There we go. Hey, friends, we'll be right back in a moment. All right. Well, Chris, thanks so much for being on Books and Looks. We certainly learned a whole lot about crimes that involve food, and I'm sure everybody on the listening end are going to really enjoy this. I hope they rush out and get this book because it's a really, really interesting look at this topic. Friends, you know, we get to that point of the week when I say, what am I looking at? And yeah, this silly season out there. There's a lot of strange things going on. You know, we've had presidential debates. I don't know how many people are running for president. Some guys dropped out already who I never knew was in the race. It's silly season. People are saying things that you just don't believe. I mean, you have AOC, Ozzy Ocasio, as I call her. She's up there saying there's no such thing as inflation. Okay, fine. Okay, good. You believe that. Anyway, but that's not what I'm really looking at. No, because what I'm looking at is what I'm watching on TV right now. And what am I watching? Women's Australian Football League. That's right. I love Aussie football. And now the women are having it. They've had this league for a few years, but it was never televised. Now it's on FS2. Yes, folks, it's on FS2. For any of you who can get that, put your DV on, DVR on. You want to see this. You want to not miss these games. This is a lot of fun. These women go at it. I'll tell you, the men are, the men are, one type of game, the women play a little bit differently. Same basic rules, but they, they play it differently. And it's a lot of fun. They put seven, 8,000 people in watching this Aussie women's football. It's a lot of fun. The one team, the Geelong Cats, okay, from Geelong in Australia, they have got three women in their starting team who are mothers. Yeah, you don't have to be 18 to 22. You could they have mothers. And the team. Not only that, one of these mothers, listen to this, gave birth by cesarean section 18 weeks ago. 18 weeks ago, she had a baby by C-section, and she's on the starting team. She's out there knocking women around, other women around, and she's kicking and throwing. I mean, it's amazing. Talk about Talk about guts. These women have got it. It is a lot of fun. Like I said, it's on FS2, usually on Saturday nights or Sunday nights, whatever they do it. But, you know, look in your schedule. FS2, they have it. DVR it. You know what? I tried watching college football this first weekend. Gosh, it's boring. Gosh, it's boring compared to this. There's constant action. There's constant motion. And you say, well, I can't figure out the rules. Just watch one or two games. It's easy to figure out. Bottom line, that's what I'm watching this week. Women's Australian Football League. You really can't beat it. So anyway, on behalf of ViewsOnBooks.com, on behalf of Podcast Studio X, this is Blaine DeSantis for Books and Looks saying, may all your leaves be pages in a book. Mm-hmm.